Hey everyone, today we're going to take a look at the Aizu Japanese Natural Whetstone. Uh, this is a Nakatoishi stone, so it is a middle grit stone. Uh, starting to get into the higher level of Nakatoishi, so we would normally think of it as a 3000 to 5000 grit whetstone, depending on the individual quality of the stone, how you finish the surface of the stone, and how you use it. Uh, Aizu has a pretty good reputation about it, and uh, me personally, it is most definitely my favorite of the Japanese whetstones, especially in the Nakatoishi range. If I had to have one whetstone forever, uh, it would probably be these Aizu. Uh, it would be unfortunate because I would never be able to use a straight razor again. Uh, these do not uh, do well besides bevel setting for straight razors, but uh, they are really wonderful stones insofar as polishing and uh, sharpening uh, knives and, and other such instruments. Uh, what makes them so good is they have a very consistent grit pattern throughout the stone. They are hard stones, but they are not so hard that they do not refresh. So while we will use a Nagara or a diamond plate to start a slurry, as we use the stone, more and more abrasive will come up on its own. However, since the stone is still fairly hard, it's kind of right on that, that cusp, it is capable of not dishing very quickly. So you get uh, a lot of mileage out of the stone. You do not uh, find that the surface becomes uneven too quickly, um, but you get that good cutting power. You get a very nice finish on your blade edge uh, when you're using it. So anyway, a little bit about the stone itself. Um, Aizu comes out of northern Japan um, around Fukushima. Uh, it is not a province unto itself, but it's a, it's a area rich in history um, and easy to find on a map. Uh, it is a kind of uh, sibling stone to Igarashi and Igarashi Kasabori. Uh, if you want to see a video comparing them visually, um, go look at the Igarashi video where I do that. Uh, this video will only be sticking with the Aizu stones. And compared to other Nakatoishi, um, they can be a little bit more difficult to find. Uh, the reason for that is the mine's closure uh, happened significantly earlier than, than other mines, whereas most Nakatoishi or Awasedo mines closed in the 1980s. Uh, the, Aizu, the primary Aizu mine closed in the 1950s. Um, the reason for this is that uh, they mined a large stock of them every year and would normally cut them in the winter when being inside wasn't as much of a problem. But during one particularly cold winter, uh, they closed off all the windows when they were cutting their blocks of Aizu and it resulted in a lot of the workers getting lung disease and obviously leading to premature deaths. And uh, after that, the mining operation closed. So uh, whereas there are a lot of wholesalers or retailers that might have stock of other Nakatoishi stones, um, the last like major wholesaler or stockpile of Aizu stones generally was distributed in uh, 1994. So you can still find them, uh, but they're either small uh, lots that people found in the back of their warehouses, or it's private collectors selling off their stock, things like that. Um, I have been in contact with a few people in Japan who are interested in reopening mining of uh, Aizu. There, there is stock of the stone that is easily accessible, um, but whether or not that ends up coming to fruition is uh, to be determined. So right now you can most definitely find Aizu. Its reputation ensures that it pops back up on the market. People, you know, don't let the stones linger in a garage, never being flipped. Uh, if people don't want them anymore, they do sell them, but they will be above average uh, priced compared to other Nakatoishi stones. Um, but that generally comes with good reason. Uh, their performance and the reputation they bring are, are well deserved. So here we have two Aizu stones. Uh, I actually have both of them out here for a reason. Um, this stone uh, on our on my left, your right, is uh, a southern Aizu stone. 
this stone is a Western Aizu stone. Uh, they came from the same region, and they uh, come from ultimately the same geological stock. However, there are differences between the two insofar as consistency of the stone um, and fineness of the stone. Uh, generally, me personally, I prefer the Southern Aizu better, um, but the Western Aizu can also do a very good job. So we'll take a brief look at these two stones, talk about their differences, and then uh, we'll get into using this one a little bit to show scratch pattern and sharpening performance. Um, you're never going to find a retailer generally say, oh, this is a Western Aizu, this is a Southern Aizu um, stone. But uh, you, as the collector or user, can take a look at the stone and determine uh, maybe what its characteristics are based off of visual or performance attributes. So let's go ahead and wet these two down. So um, you can see that they share similar properties. They both turn, obviously, this bluish color. Um, one of the main differences between them is that this, uh, the Western ones uh, tend to be a little bit more green in color. Um, they tend to not be the same color as an Igarashi, but they seem to maybe have more in common with it. Uh, whereas these southern Aizu are very blue, very gray in color. Um, additionally, if we take a look at the, uh, which I'll try to zoom up here some, if we take a look at the actual uh, pattern of the stone itself, the western Aizu tends to be a little bit less consistent with the feldspar spots and general composition of the stone. If you zoom up at a macro level on both of these stones, that difference uh, follows through. This stone uh, will have a more uh, porous, hole-filled surface with these little uh, gray inclusions in it. Um, not that the inclusions are bad, they don't cause you a problem, just as these white feldspar inclusions don't cause you a problem. Um, but they are there, versus this one will be, it'll look finer at a macro level, and uh, it will be more consistent, more of what you expect when you look at the surface. They're both very usable stones. They are both, you know, for practical purposes, Aizu, um, and I like using both of them. I do find that the Western Aizu tends to not refresh as readily on its own. So between these, if I keep polishing on the stone for five minutes, uh, it will always refresh. Versus this stone, maybe after five minutes, it will start to exhaust. It may still refresh itself, but it won't refresh itself as aggressively. Um, consequently though, this stone maybe can get a little bit finer than this stone, you know, we would say the stone's a little harder. So uh, your mileage may vary. I don't think that unless if you are going to get a bunch of Aizu, uh, the differences matter too much. Um, but if you want a Aizu that is truly, you know, in a progression polishing lineup where you know you're going to delete its scratches afterwards, or you want something that can power through a lot of different knives or blades, I would look for this more consistent southern Aizu. Um, if you just want an Aizu and uh, you're going to finish one knife on it or you're going to do a bit of polishing on it, um, this western Aizu is also very, very good. Uh, anyway, so we're going to put this western one aside and take a look at at this Aizu here. So unlike the other Nakatoishi, we're starting to hit the range where how you finish the surface of the stone before you go to use it will make a large difference. So uh, our, you know, if you look at the Binswe video, the Ikarashi video, I always used our 140 Atoma diamond plate. Um, I could use a 140 Atoma diamond plate on this Aizu, and it will perform until we even out the surface and wear down the grit, a lot like an Igarashi, actually. Um, they are not exactly the same. If you're being particular about deleting your scratches, the Igarashi is coarser and, uh, and will do a better job at giving you that step. But if you're just doing a knife edge, this at 140 can generally fill in briefly for that earlier step. 
Uh, alternatively, uh, you can also use your finer grit Atomas. Uh, this is a 1200. Um, it can work on this Izu, but uh, I think the Izus respond best to the the 600s, uh, the 600 grit plates. However, I don't have mine with me, so we are going to use the 1200. Um, either or can work. I do generally prefer the 600 to 1200 uh, diamond plates for this work, though, because the Izu is just a little bit of that additional level of fineness. And uh, I find I don't want that super coarse grit that is going to force me to work through it. Um, I have the Ikarashi or, you know, other preceding stones. If I want to use those, uh, if I want to get a coarser grit, I'll just use those. So there we go. We got our base slurry. Let's go ahead and see how it treats our knife here. So for a natural whetstone, this is pretty good cutting power. Um, you can see it's not overly thirsty. I can continue to work the water I put on it and we don't run out. It will eventually need another spray or two, but unlike the Ikarashi or the Binswe, uh, it doesn't need that more consistent request for water. Though uh, obviously we're just starting to use it from dry, so it's going to I'm going to give it a little bit more here, but if you're using it for five minutes or multiple knives, you will find that it stops, it almost stops asking for water entirely. Um, we definitely have good cutting performance. You can see we're getting a lot of swarf built up. And one of the really nice things about, especially these southern Izu stones, is they are slick. They feel really great on the blade. They don't give you too much friction, but they give you the feedback you want so you can feel what parts of the knife are touching the blade. And uh, they do keep pulling up that abrasive. So you can see every time I go back to it, um, whether I hit an area that had slurry or not, it will give me more abrasive power it'll keep pulling up Swarf and keep the cutting going. All right, let's take a look. Do one more. And as with the rest of these, it's not going to be a perfect job. Um, you know, it's, it's for presentation purposes, but uh, it will do a good enough job and show you the characteristics of the stone. So let's take a look at what we got. And we got that nice tra traditional Izu finish. Um, <clears throat> Izu is usually the last step where you get cutting uh, pattern in the core steel, uh, but it is extremely light, extremely shallow. The minute we touch it onto an awasado, we're going to uh, easily get those scratches deleted so long as we followed our progression well and actually deleted all the scratches before the Izu. And while we have scratches in our core steel, they are again very consistent. Uh, fairly light scratches and they'll be deleted uh, either in our next or this the preceding uh, step after that or the succeeding step after that so let's go ahead and try to get closer here
And similar to last time, let's go ahead and see what our autofocus can do for us here. All right. So that's the finish you can expect out of these Izu stones. Um, the Western Izu will perform very similarly. Uh, I think that it tends to look similar on the surface. And the differences you'll feel are in, again, um, that eventually the Western stone may exhaust its surface, and you'll just have to refresh it with a Nagra or a diamond plate. But you still get a lot of mileage out of it. It takes a, a, lot, a lot of time for that to happen. Um, the southern ones will just go and go and go. So anyway, uh, let's go ahead and sharpen on the surface a little bit still. And I failed to do this in the Igarashi video, but I won't fail here. Let's go ahead and just clear off all of our standing swarf so that you can get an idea of uh, what its cutting performance looks like on its own. We'll use a 1200 again, just to get a little bit going. And I mean, the 1200 is pulling up only the most mild amount of slurry for some just generic lubrication. And let's go ahead and see what we get. So we have our burr for sure with that. And similar to the last times I do it, probably has the burr before I start feeling it, but that was really not all that much time. And if we go ahead and knock it off, it's cutting reasonably fast. Uh, again, if you're coming from a synthetic background, all these stones are slow. All these stones are like slow synthetic stones. But for uh, natural wet stones, this is doing a very good job of not blasting through our steel, but giving us consistent performance. Our burr is gone. And uh, this stage of Naka Toishi is uh, the first stage where when we start feeling our uh, blade edge after knocking the burr off, um, there's teeth but it's very refined. Um, it's not grabbing my thumb like the other stuff, like Binswe or Igarashi or those early level stones do. Um, it's definitely still not polished. You know, if we look at it in the light, which is gonna be impossible to do on the camera, it, you don't get that amazing mirror edge on it, but you do get a hazy edge on it. And uh, this is a really versatile edge. Uh, I will often stop here for my utility petty uh, or nakiri knives uh, whereas you know if i'm expecting to slice through a lot of meat or i want really clean precision i still might uh, I, you know i would still go onto the awasado stones but this is in my opinion the first of the real stops where you can make uh, in knife sharpening and be happy additionally this uh, scratch pattern that we've left on our knife could be very easily cleaned up with some Uchigimori finger stones or Gyojo, uh, Gyojo finger stones, and um, it would leave a really beautiful finish on the knife. So anyway, that's our Aizu Japanese Nakatoishi whetstone. I hope uh, it gave you some information about the stone you found useful and a general idea of how it performs, uh, and it will help you decide what you want in your collection. Anyway, until next time.